My name is Russell Working. I've been working for 45 years as a journalist, both for major newspapers and as a freelancer. In the late 90s and early 2000s, I worked out of the Russian Far East. While I was there, I ran across a fascinating story. My wife and I were visiting the city of Habarovsk, which is in the Russian Far East, not far from the Sea of Japan, on the Amur River. There we discovered an old man who had been the interpreter for the last emperor of China. And what's more amazing, he had met him 80 years before that when he was a little boy. That little boy fooling around by a pond is me, Georgi Permyakov. A few feet away, a young man reads on a bench. We're in a park in the city of Tianjin, northeast China, to where my parents emigrated to shortly after I was born. I was minding my own business, not paying any attention to the man on the bench. Then suddenly, I fell into the pond. When I heard the man on the bench laugh, I decided to splash around, and he laughed even louder. My parents later told me that man was none other than Fu Yi, the last emperor of China. Fu Yi probably didn't give another thought to the boy he met in the park. He had plenty of other things to think about. The Japanese made him the puppet emperor of Manchukuo, their state they created in northeastern China. The two had no further encounters until years later when Permyakov returned to Russia and was working as an interpreter for the Soviet government. He was astonished to find out that the last emperor of China was now going to be a prisoner and he was the personal interpreter for him. And amazingly enough, the emperor remembered him. Permyakov had grown up in China and so he spoke Chinese fluently. He knew the language, he knew the culture, and he was an ideal person to work within the camp. He just helped him to understand this new and alien environment in which he found himself. So from the beginning of their time in the camp, the two felt a connection. It established a trust between them. December 1945, Eastern Russia. Puyi is now under the custody of the Soviet Union, and that's me, on my very first day as his personal translator. The room had not much to do with the prison cell. It was sparse, but comfortable enough. I offered books as a greeting present. He accepted his gifts, and then I told him about our previous encounter, which he remembered very well and he started to laugh like he had all those years ago. During the interview, Permyakov suddenly said he had artifacts that he could show us, prove his connection to the last emperor of China. Permyakov suddenly cleared off his desk and pulled out the red fan and the watch. It was, he said that this had been the wristwatch of the last emperor of China. Permyakov spent a lot of time with the former emperor while he was in prison. The two men got to know each other quite well. Permyakov instructed him daily in Communist Party doctrine and in Russian language. But seeing that Puyi was hopelessly bored in prison and trying to help him adjust to his post-imperial life, Permyakov assigned him to write a series of essays, actually more like notes in a notebook about China and Chinese life. He wrote about all kinds of fascinating topics. He wrote about fairy tales or uh, legend in, in Chinese. He wrote about the relationships of family members. That in itself was kind of poignant because Puyi had been taken away from his family when he was two years old. At two years old, he was elevated to the dragon throne. He served as sort of a figurehead emperor, so he never really knew his family well until he was much older.
，就是润琦画画，他题字，做那批画作。从这批画作当中呢，画作的内容，我们可以明显感到，溥仪，溥仪是非常眷恋他儿时的时光，眷恋他在北京紫禁城当小皇帝的时的时光。Puyi was the last of the Qing dynasty, or the Manchus. They were known for their interest in clocks and timepieces. One very special watch that Puyi had, he was wearing daily for many years. We know this from his servants. Li Guoxiong 跟随溥仪三十三年，他知道溥仪的很多情况。我是从一九八二年十月份开始，对李国雄进行了。二十多次的采访，一直到一九八二年年底，李国雄给我们讲述了很多鲜为人知的事情。他对溥仪的了解是非常透彻的，也是非常熟悉的。因为溥仪手边手头的珍宝无数，他能把他带到苏联，就可见他对这块白金手表的真实程度。Puyi inherited this from his ancestors. He personally loved watches. He collected them. He wore them. Li Guoxiong told me a very interesting story. He said, "When I was in the Soviet Union, one day, I and Puyi stayed for a long time. Puyi took out his watch and said to me, 'Dear Li, look at this watch. It's Puyi's watch. 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 你把表盲都给我起开，我看看里头到底是是不是白金的。The man standing next to Pu Yi is Big Li, his most trusted servant. During his captivity, the former emperor had kept certain possessions with him, including wristwatches. Now, why would anyone scratch a watch? Well. Pui had asked Big Li to find out what the dial was made of. Perhaps it was gold. It was not. So they stopped and let the watch be, as it still is today. So for us doing our job, getting getting a set of objects like this is is really fascinating. Having a group of complex objects actually allows us to make a better case for material authenticity. And these objects tell a wonderful story, which we're then able to look at and corroborate. You're helping provide another insight into history from a completely other avenue that's available to the connoisseur. It's hard to know exactly. How Puyi felt about Permyakov because he did not write about him specifically. He briefly mentions an interpreter in this camp in the city of Havarovsk in Russia. However, Puyi had a way of forming relationships with people who were important to him. The first being Reginald Johnson, his Scottish tutor in the Forbidden City. So, in looking at a particular object in the group, the inscribed fan, we started by checking that the fan in its entirety was of the period. We took a very tiny sliver of bamboo off the edge of one of the struts and subjected it to carbon-14 dating, so that we could make sure it was of the right period, which all checked out. We also looked at the paper. We looked at the pigments used, the metal paints, and the inks, which equally were all very much of the time. Permyakov would have been a Another one that he looked to for guidance in an alien environment. The two men got to know each other quite well over that period. It was Permyakov who was chosen to accompany a Soviet delegation then that went to Tokyo in 1946 for the Tokyo trials. Once we had established that the object was very much materially consistent with the time that it was proposed to have been made, we had a stylistic expert come in and look at the handwriting, comparing it to examples that were were able to be found of Puyi's writing, and making sure that the ink inscriptions that were there were plausibly by him. And indeed, it all did check out. Pyrmikov knew that the former emperor. Loved poetry. He had loved it since he was a child. He had written poems. He had gotten poems published under pseudonyms. And so, as they sat together in the villa of the Soviet embassy in 1946, he had a special request for the emperor. In the summer of 1946, Puyi had to stand as a witness in the Tokyo trials. I stayed with him at the Soviet embassy. 
and one evening, I offered him a traditional paper fan. I asked him if he would kindly write a poem on it. He started right away. Puyi had always cultivated a passion for artistry and delicate objects. I watched him dip the brush into the ink and find the right words in the depths of his imagination. Once he had finished, he handed me back the fan with a smile of gratitude, and his poem took me away. The relationship they had was a surprising one because the emperor was considered a almost sacred person and was protected from others. It was not like him to have pals around. People were there to wait on him and serve him. Even his relatives took a role, a servant-like role in prison. And so there was this unusual relationship with Pyramikov. And yeah, my sense is that probably he regarded Pyramikov as a friend as well. 在比尔缅库夫的家中看到比尔缅库保存的批溥仪的物品心情非常激动看到润其画画溥仪题字的那幅作品时瞬间感到这批东西成一个系列是很珍贵的溥仪写给比尔缅库的上面是非常罕见的
we're working with art, even though we're looking at materials and stories and histories of pigments and binding media and papers and such, we love the objects themselves, which is why working on such projects like this for Philips is really exciting. Today, 